I ask for the wisdom that you promised if we lack it and need it. Lord, I need it. I need wisdom tonight, Heavenly Father, to discern these spirits and ferret out what we're dealing here. And Father, I need the gift of teaching that I may be able to convey it to the people who hear it. Then, Father, give them hearts to receive it. Let it fall on good ground, Lord. May it take root in their heart. And Father, may it produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness, Lord, and the work of the Holy Spirit tonight. God, wake us up. Wake us up, Father. Wake us up. We ask it in Jesus' name. And amen. amen. All right. Good to have everybody that's here. And if you're visiting with us, you certainly are welcome. You are in the midst of friends. Amen, amen. If you'd like to turn with me to the Bible, the book of 2 Thessalonians, please. 2 Thessalonians. Now, when I look at this book, I can say to myself for certain, the government didn't write it. And I can look at it again. I said, the school system didn't write this book. <clears throat> I'll look at it again. You begin to go down the list and eliminate the people who did not write it. Amen. Man didn't write it. No, sir. No. Man would not portray himself the way this Bible. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Nobody likes to open himself up for that kind of scrutiny. So man didn't write the Bible. So who wrote it? God wrote it. God wrote the Bible. And when he wrote the Bible, of course, he wrote it from his perspective, used human agency to do it, but the author of the Bible is God. Amen. The Bible, therefore, fits in a peculiar category, and that's the category of prophecy. It's able to look into the future. Amen. The Bible was written, the part you're reading here, 2,000 years ago, and it looks into the future. Now, there's not a soul in this house right here that could tell me what's going to happen next Tuesday. No, no, sir. Not a soul. And if you could tell what was going to happen <clears throat> next Tuesday or next week or the week after, you would immediately become a multimillionaire because all you'd have to do is start buying and selling stock on the stock market. You'd be unspeakably rich. Know which stocks fall, which rise, when to buy, when to sell. Nobody knows that. God knows the future. And he's the only one that does. He knows the future. So in the book of Second Thessalonians chapter number 2, and verse number 1. <clears throat> the Bible says this. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together to him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all, note carefully, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You cannot read any more serious words on the face of this earth than what you just read. And I want to call your attention to what he says here in verse 11, delusion. Verse 10, deceivableness. Verse number uh, 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or in spirit as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. Deception is the very heart and soul of the churches, of the government, of politics, and of this world. Everything that you're dealing with today has an agenda behind it. Amen. You can take nothing at face value. You're going to have to research what people are saying, find out where they're coming from, 
Find out the source of the material. Find out the agenda behind it. The only one that you can trust completely, fully, and wholly is God. Amen. You can't trust man. Don't put your trust in man. When the Lord Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, the Bible said, Neither did he put his trust in them, neither did he confide in them, for he knew what was in man. This is something that I've learned after the few years I've been on this earth. You cannot trust man. And don't even trust yourself. You're going to have to trust revelation. You're going to have to trust the truth. You can't trust your feelings. You can't trust your emotions. You certainly cannot put your trust in a political party or in a movement, a thing, a church, a doctrine, a place. Your trust must be placed in the Lord. I'm going to read some scriptures for you here tonight that uh, will help us understand some things about the Bible that uh, most folks would find hard to believe. John 5, 43 says, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. The Lord Jesus was rejected, but he said one will come in his own name, and you'll receive him. The one he's talking about here is the Antichrist. He prophesied in Matthew 24, verse 24, there shall arise false Christ, pseudo Christ, false Christ. Mark 13, he said, false Christ, false prophets shall arise. Luke 21, verse 8 says, and he said, take heed, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. A false Christ is a false Messiah. Christ means Messiah. Messiah is Hebrew, Christ is Greek. They both mean the same thing. They mean the anointed one. A person's understanding of what it means to be an anointed one varies completely from one end of this earth to the other. To the Jew, the anointed one means one God's put his hand on, has a special gift from God, who comes to the people to give them light, to lead them out of captivity, to lead them into greatness, things of that nature. To the Jew, to say that one is a Messiah is no way means that he's saying he's the Son of God. Don't ever make that mistake. Just because somebody in the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the Messiah does not mean for a minute that he's saying he's the Son of God. For the, now I know you, take, you see how quiet it is in here. And the reason for that is because for 50 or 60 or 70 years, people have been hearing around here how that Messiah and Son of God are synonymous. They are not. They are not. They absolutely are not. Messiah means the anointed of God. It means the anointed one. But for one to call Jesus Christ the Son of God must be an absolute revelation from the Father. That's why the Apostle Peter, when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. To understand him to be the Son of God is to step out of Judaism. Because the Jew never has believed that. And he'll never believe it until Christ the Messiah shows up with the nail prints in his hands and he sees him as the Son of God. The Jew must accept him as Messiah, certainly, but they will accept him as the Son of God. And they will accept him as the Son of God, therefore their understanding of the very nature of God will change because it will be God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. There is no Jew on the face of this earth unless he's a born-again Christian that believes in the Trinity. No Jew believes in the Trinity. That's an absolute non-thing. They do not believe in the Trinity. Hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. So the understanding of Messiah can run the gamut all the way from the Jew's understanding of the Messiah as the anointed one, where God has anointed him, given him special grace, given him special favor, giving him special gifts, to the secular understanding of Messiah. Now listen carefully to what I'm saying. For the world to understand Messiah and their definition of the term Messiah would simply mean an elevated one or a smart one or a great leader or somebody who's inspired like Shakespeare was inspired or like a certain other individuals have been inspired. Therefore, when they call him the Messiah, they're not necessarily referring to him as the Son of God. They're calling him the Messiah. And I'm leading up to something tonight by saying all of that to you. I'm laying a groundwork for you to understand where I'm headed with this. So you'll understand that uh, there's, a, there's a term in, in the English grammar that's called semantics. And semantics simply means that 
One person puts a meaning on a word, but somebody else may put an entirely different meaning on that word. They may be speaking the same words to each other and not understanding each other because they understand them in a different way. And it's a, very, it's, 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 it's a thing that's not, uh, not that easy to put your hand on, uh, to, to, to lay out here. Because uh, when I say Son of God, when I say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, here's what I mean. I mean that He is the only one of His kind, there's not another one like Him, that He is the second person of the Trinity. That He is equal with the Father. That He's God manifest in the flesh. When I say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I could not say anything higher about Him than that. But when a New Ager says that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it's an entirely different meaning. If Oprah Winfrey said that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, her meaning on that would be entirely different than what my meaning would be. Now you follow me here. So you've got to be very careful about the way people use words and the terms they use. You've got to understand where they're coming from. Who are these people? What do they believe that means? And so that's what we're dealing with tonight. And that's why it's so important for a Christian to have all of their definitions biblical. When the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, what does the Bible mean by that? Not what the world understands it to mean or what religion even says it. What does the Bible mean when it says that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God? Amen. What's that mean? The Bible does not say that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son of God. That's a perversion. That He's the only begotten Son of God. Amen. Begotten by the Father, by the power of the Holy Ghost. He's the God-man born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem of Judea. All right. Therefore, you live in a generation that has completely turned upside down biblical truths, and they don't understand these truths the way people used to. Fifty years ago, the average man on the street, if you said that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, he'd know exactly what you were talking about. Even if he never darkened a church door, he knew what you were talking about. And now we've gone through about 50 years of indoctrination and brainwashing and semantics and terms have changed their meaning. They don't mean the same anymore. And this is what people are dealing with today. When you're talking to someone, you think they understand what you're saying, but they are understanding it in a completely different light than what the Bible means. And remember, it's not how you understand it in your culture. That's meaningless. It's how the Bible presents that term and defines it. That's what matters. That's why it's so important to stick with a Bible that sticks with the text. That's why the books like The Message and, 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 and uh, translations like that are so deceptive because what they've done is take the very meaning of Scripture and put it into the language of today and the language of today is completely changed. The way people talk today and the way they define things today have nothing to do with biblical truth. That's the problem you get into. And that's a big problem, folks. So, the Bible says in 2 Timothy, chapter number 3 and verse 13, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Well, that's God aware of this. He certainly is. I'm going to give you four scriptures tonight to help you understand where I'm headed. In 1 Kings chapter number 22 and verse 22, the Lord said to him, wherewith, and he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. He said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. God sent forth a lying spirit from his presence into the prophets of Ahab. God did. God did that. Not passively in the sense that he allowed it to happen, directively in the sense that he sent that spirit. He commanded him, and he went forth. Ezekiel chapter number 14, verse 9 says, And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand upon him and destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 18, verse 10, it came to pass in the morrow, the evil spirit from the Lord, from God, came upon Saul. So when we come down to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse 11, and for this God, cause, God shall send them strong delusion. A lot of people believe that God could not do such a thing as that. That God could not send forth a delusion, but He will. He will. Now, 
it's up to us to try to figure out the nature of that. And I'm not sure we have the nature of it figured out. But what's the nature of that delusion? Because God will send it forth. In other words, how is he going to do this? In the book of Romans, chapter number 11 and verse 8, the Bible says, According as it is written, God hath given them, the Jews, the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear to this day. The spirit of slumber. Therefore, the New Testament is closed to the Jew as a collective body of people. It is. The Jews are not going to be... Now, individual Jews are saved because a remnant of Jews are saved in every generation. But the collective body of people of the Jews will not be saved until the second advent, until the Lord appears to them. All right? He, God, sent the spirit of slumber upon them. They couldn't see, couldn't hear. In a sense, that's a form of deception. Not that he's deceiving them, but he certainly closed their eyes, didn't he? Fact is, your eyes won't open till he opens them. And your ear won't open till he opens it. But and not to get into all that tonight, but I want to make my point that the Jew right now does not understand the New Testament uh, personage of Christ because God has given them the spirit of slumber. Note that spirit. There's a spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. The one who opens your heart to who Christ is the Holy Spirit. When he has come into the world, he will convince men of sin because they believe not on me. The primary work, the first work of the Holy Spirit is to show you who Christ is. Open your heart to him and then show you who you are. And that brings you to conviction. Well, notice it's a spiritual thing. Notice it's a spiritual thing. It's on a spiritual level. It's not physical. Men do not reject Jesus Christ on physical grounds because there's something physically about him they don't like or that he doesn't appeal to them physically. Men reject Jesus Christ because of a spiritual decision. The natural man, dead spiritually, he's an enemy to God. He rejects him on spiritual grounds. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians 4.14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The Greek word translated deceive is the Greek word plane. That Greek word plane literally means to put into the mind a carrying away, a falling away, a fading away. In plainer words, the power of the Spirit to Cause the vision not to see right or not to hear right. To be led away in the mind. That's why the Bible is so important when it talks about words. The scripture says you're begotten by the word. What you hear and what you receive by word is going to make a difference in what you are. Words are very important. If you receive the word of truth, the word of truth is going to direct you correctly. It's going to build you up in the faith. It's going to draw you closer to the Lord. But if you receive error, that error is going to lead you astray. In plain words, if you believe it, to receive something is to believe it. You can hear, as the old timer said, goes in one ear and out the other. That doesn't affect you. You hear a lot of things. You don't dwell on it, pay no attention to it, let it go. But when you take something into your heart and hold it in there and begin to weigh it and begin to look at it and consider it, if it's not the truth, it can become a canker, literally eating away at the very foundation of what you believe. Words are important. Therefore, if Satan can plant something inside you that can cause you to doubt God, doubt his love and doubt his purpose, doubt his nature, then he'll eat you with that. He'll eat you with it. He'll eat you with it. He'll eat you with it. You with it. And this is the way it works today. All it takes is a word rightly said, planted in the right place, and you can create disciples. This is why it's so important to understand that, that words are important. This is why that the enemy gets his message out. He wants his words out there. The reason he does is because his words have power. They have weight. You have to decide... You have to make a conscious decision with every word you receive whether you're going to believe it or not. If you consciously reject it and say, that's a lie, I don't believe that much foolishness, it's gone. It doesn't bother you anymore. But if, you're, if you are not 
if you cannot just consciously say, well, I don't believe that, it, uh, you know, you haven't just passed it off. You haven't come against it in, in a sense. You haven't just said, no, I don't, I'm not going to receive that. Then you have received it. And all it takes is a little doubt. And doubt's the very enemy that undermines faith. So words are important. You take a generation that's never been taught about who Jesus Christ is. They don't really know Him. They don't know who He is. Like I say, to say Son of God to them may not mean the same things it does to you. Say Messiah to them doesn't mean the same things it does to you. You take a generation that is born and bred and raised on relativism. In other words, if it feels good to me, it's good for me. If it feels good to you, it's good for you. If you're God's good God, you're God's good God. My God's a good God. My God's a good God. Let's put all our gods together and let's get the best from all our gods. That's what the average American thinks in his heart. Even going to church Sunday after Sunday, he's not rooted and grounded in the truth. So therefore, when you present him with a lie and with error and falsehood, he doesn't know how to differentiate, to weed through it, find the difference. Enter Oprah Winfrey. When Oprah Winfrey, who was a, I suppose, a news analyst or announcer, what have you, built her reputation and uh, has built quite a following in this country, if you mention her name, it's a buzzword. You either line up on one side or you line up on the other immediately. Uh, why? Because If you know anything, you do. Because if you know that Oprah Winfrey has become a new age priestess, then you'll understand what I'm saying. What's the new age movement? The new age movement is a religious movement <coughs> started back in the 60s with the, age, the announcing of the age of Aquarius with the music of that day coinciding with the, uh, with the astrological charts and all the rest of that. It's a, it was a time when the earth is experiencing a new birth entering into a new millennium. And it was a transitional time. It didn't happen overnight. It took time. The New Age movement introduced the world to spirits. It introduced the world to a new world, a new age, a new kind of thinking. And, uh, and, and caused people to look at themselves in an entirely different way than they ever had before. And a lot of people have bought into it. I'm talking about all the way from PhDs to, to uh, janitors. They bought into the New Age movement. They bought into the idea and Oprah Winfrey is teaching it and preaching it, and she's pushing it out. And she is very effective, and she's getting her message out. She has teamed up with Eckhart Tolle. He's I th probably a German or a Dutchman or something. And uh, this man has written a, uh, uh, a number of books, I'm sure. But uh, uh, he has a 10-week seminar. His new book is A New Earth, Awakening Your Life's Purpose. And uh, the point is that he wants to teach you through Oprah and through her multi-million dollar ability to get, the, to get their message out. He wants to teach people about their God-given potential and who they are. And so Oprah has teamed up with him and she, uh, she is one of the most powerful women in the world, according to Forbes magazine, with a net worth of more than $1,000 million dollars. She's an Academy Award nomination, nominee, a hit television show, successful magazine, oh, the Oprah magazine, the cable channel, Oxygen Media. She reaches millions of viewers each day. Oprah Winfrey has now turned a significant portion of her show to New Age religion. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about Mr. Eckhart Tolle, but apparently, uh, according to this uh, writer, he is a narcissist. Spends a lot of time playing the words. His, his whole life's about himself and about how great he is. Uh, Bill Keller of LivePrayer.com says that Oprah may be the most dangerous woman in the world. Because of her New Age preaching, she's rejected Jesus Christ as the one true Savior. In his book, uh, A New Earth, Awakening Your Life's Purpose, a million people have already signed up for the 10-week course offered on the Internet. Uh, here are some takeaways, as it's called, from his book. In plain words, here's what his book teaches. Number one, there is no sin. Number two, a slain Christ has no meaning. Number three, the journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. Number four, 
Do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross that you just sang about. The name of Jesus Christ as such is but a symbol. It is a symbol that is safely used as a replacement for the many names of all the gods to which you pray. God is in everything I see. Now, do you see where we're headed? They have a classical term for that in theology. It's called pantheism. The recognition of God is the recognition of yourself. A lot of people think, well, what's this got to do with us? It's got a lot to do with you. The oneness of the Creator and the creation is your wholeness, your sanity, and your limitless power. The atonement is the final lesson he, man, need learn. For it teaches him that never having sinned, he has no need of salvation. Now, the bottom line is that uh, this man here in his book, his New Age guru, is not new with any of it. That's not the only man spouting that kind of doctrine. Uh, Marianne Williamson, who is a New Age uh, priestess, uh, in, her, in her work, it's, it's New Age doctrine. The New Age doctrine is that you are God. There is no sin. <clears throat> you need no Savior. There is no atonement, no, necess no necessity for that. And on and on and on it goes. So Oprah is preaching and teaching her New Age doctrine day in and day out. That's why it's so important to preach and teach the Word of God. Amen. Now, we're living in a generation, as I told you a moment ago, that doesn't have a clue about the Bible and the personage of Jesus Christ. Here's a young woman from Smith College. The name of her paper is The Sophian. I assume that means from Sophia, the Greek word which means wisdom. The Sophian, the student press. And here's what she says. Now, remember what I taught you last Wednesday night. You remember what I said about Barack Obama? I did not say he's the Antichrist. I did not say he's the man of sin. I said he's a politician. He's a human being just like you. I did not say that when he goes in office that he's going to be the Antichrist. But I did tell you this. I told you people are worshiping him. And when I said that, I said that in the sense that there is an absolutely new element that has been introduced into this political campaign that has never been before. Now listen to this young woman right here. Listen to these words. Her name is Maggie Mertens, issue 91808, September the 18th, 2008. So this is, uh, this is current. I will follow him. Obama as my personal Jesus. Obama is my homeboy. And I'm not saying that because he's black. I'm saying that in reference to those Urban Outfitters t-shirts from a couple of years ago that said, quote, Jesus is my homeboy. Yes, I just said it. Obama is my Jesus. While you may be overtly religious and find this to be idol worshiping or may be overtly politically correct and just know that everything in that sentence could be found offensive, I'm afraid it's true anyway. She's a college student, describes how she came to Obama during a dark time in her life and how he is indeed her savior. Here she is in her own words, quote, I've officially been saved and soon, whether they like it or not, the rest of the country will be too. I will follow him all the way to the White House, and I'll be standing there in our nation's capital in January 2009 when Barack Obama is inaugurated as the 44th President of the United States of America. In the name of Obama, amen. Now, what do you think? Now, this is not Obama saying this. This is not Barack Obama saying this. I'm not accusing him of saying this. He doesn't even know this girl. And, uh, but, but, but my point is this, if this girl had had any Bible knowledge whatsoever, number one, she'd never said that. See, that was my point to begin with. But number two, this country, uh, so many people in this country don't have a clue about spirituality. 
You see, they, here she is. She's thinking, here's a man that's going to be my Jesus, my what? My Savior, my Messiah. Okay? She doesn't understand the term Son of God. That wouldn't really mean anything to her. Because as far as she's concerned, her salvation is here and now. See? Right here, right now. Now, here's a sad thing. Do you think she's alone? No, she's not. You can get on the web, get on the internet, spend a little time on there, and you'll find by their tens of thousands. Now, not all people who are going to vote for Barack Obama believe this. Not for a minute. Not for a minute. Fact is, a lot of those people are already critical, highly critical of this cult worship. That's right. To be completely fair with Barack Obama, there are many Democrats who are saying, this is a bunch of junk, this is foolishness, this is stupidity, and they are highly critical. My purpose as a preacher of the gospel and a preacher of this book is to show you how that the foundation has already been laid for men on this earth to receive a man in the place of God and to be able to look at that man and say, that's my Savior. And that's exactly what the book of Revelation chapter number 13 says, that they'll look at him and say, that's God. That's God. And when you have someone like Oprah Winfrey on there telling people, I'm God. Well, Barack's God. You're God. He's God. So somebody says he's God. No big deal. That's my God. That's my Savior. That's my Jesus. That's what she said. I didn't put any words in her mouth. Now, that ought to be the kind of thing that ought to make you think, boy, man, let me dust my Bible off and start reading it again. I mean, 50 years ago, somebody had said that you'd say, they're ready for the funny farm. And 50 years ago, they would have been ready for the funny farm. 50 years ago, when somebody had said that some human being was God, was Jesus, was their Savior, people would have looked at them and said, you're missing a cog. But friend, what's that thing called when you saturate a whole world? When it reaches the point of saturation to where they call evil good and good evil? Black, white, white, black. Up, down, down, up. Left, right, left, right, left. They can't tell the difference. Do you think it would be a big deal for God to send a strong delusion? Does this woman need any deluding? She's ready. She's already ready. All right, listen to this. This is a secular writer. This is secular writer. And uh, Tuesday, October the 21st, 2008. I'm not a religious person. However, I'd like to point out a funny irony that would be better suited for a cartoonist. What if all the religious nuts were bashing the second coming of their Christ, and they didn't even know it. Fathered by a Kenyan Muslim prophet who left after his task was done to see the woman who in the heartland of America, a country who is losing its way, then takes him on a journey of awakening across the world, then back home to spread the word of the Lord through a process of education and then actions in the community. The Bible says... He quotes the Bible. The Lord shall come as a man whom blind followers will not see. Somebody find that for me. You know what he just said? Let me interpret it for you. Here's what he said. Here's a secular writer. What if all you nuts over there, you Baptist nuts, that are looking for a Lord to come out of the heavens and come and get you, we're so wrong because what if Barack Obama was your Jesus who had reincarnated himself in a man through a Kenyan prophet? That's what he said. So how many of you religious nuts in here tonight think you might be wrong? Aren't you glad over there in the book of Acts he said this same Jesus shall so come how? As you've seen him go? Isn't it amazing 2,000 years ago that the Bible knew that somebody would say that today? As you've seen him go, he'll so come in like manner. And then to, to the Apostle Paul, he said, I show you a mystery. Did not the Bible say, lo, here is Christ or there is Christ? Believe it not. False Christ shall arise. Now, you've all heard of Mr. Farrakhan. He says the Messiah, Obama's absolutely speaking. And I, would, I am certain that Barack Obama 
would disassociate himself from that statement because that's, that's not going to help his case. Louis Farrakhan's support would be like Adolf Hitler supporting somebody. Amen. A website called The Slate, the Obama Messiah Watch, here's what they say. Is Barack Obama, junior U.S. Senator from Illinois, best-selling author, Harvard Law Review editor, men's Vogue cover model, an exploratory presidential candidate, the second coming of our Savior and our Redeemer, Prince of Peace and King of Kings, Jesus Christ? You remember what I told you? If it goes in here and out here, what's that mean? It means you, you heard it, but you didn't hear it. You didn't care. But if it comes in here and you think to yourself, well, what if he was? Boy. Is there any doubt in your mind? Is there any doubt in your mind that some man may show up, say, it may not be Mr. Obama, it may be somebody else, and show up and say, I'm Jesus Christ. Look at my charisma. People are falling before me. They're worshiping. Little children are singing songs. Do you know children being born today are called Barack? People are, they have a, they had, they had a song on the web that was uh, uh, it, it, in his sanctuary. There's a new song. We don't ever sing it in here, but I know, it's other churches have sung it about his sanctuary. How many, I know you've heard that, haven't you? Uh, I'll be a sanctuary. I'll be a sanctuary. It's only got something like 22 words. Well, they use that song. And a sanctuary, of course, is talking about I'll be a sanctuary for God. But all these people on there were talking about Barack Obama. And they changed the word of God and made it refer to Barack Obama. And uh, that thing went wild on the Internet. I mean, that thing spread like wildfire. And they took it off. And they realized what they were doing. They had to be careful about it. All right? So, sanctuary. It's a church hymn for Jesus. And... Uh, it's amazing, it's amazing, it's amazing, it's amazing, I'm telling you, uh, the old timer said if you smell smoke there's a fire, do you have to have somebody slap you in the face? Now, I'm not accusing Barack Obama of having anything to do with any of this. And there is no way under the sun he can know everything that's going on in the party. can't do that. That's impossible. No man does. And if this had been said about John McCain, I'd be doing the same thing. Make no mistake about that. If they had turned John McCain into a god, I would be teaching you the same thing. Because it's my responsibility to do that. All right. So, once again, Barack Obama is a politician who is running for the President of the United States. He's the Democrat Party nominee. Next Tuesday, this nation will vote, and one man or the other, either John McCain or Barack Obama, will become the 44th President of the United States. I am not saying he's the Antichrist, I am not saying he's the man of sin. But I have proved to you without question people are worshiping him and that a spiritual atmosphere has come into this country that is laying the groundwork for the man of sin. That the world is ready to worship a man. That's what I have showed you. And there is no doubt about it. None in my mind. And it shouldn't be any in yours. You live in the midst of people who are irrational, unstable, ignorant, and grasping at straws. You live in the midst of people who do not know whether they're coming or they're going. They don't know what they're in this world for. And they're trying to find meaning. And all it takes for some of these people is a charismatic personality. An intelligent man. Barack Obama's IQ is 142. John McCain's IQ is 138. 150. And you can get in Mensa. That's the upper end. A lot of those guys in Mensa don't know whether they're coming or going either. 
But the truth of the matter is, these are both highly intelligent men. John McCain is very intelligent, and so is Barack Obama. I mean, four-point spread between the two of them. It could be one has strengths in one area, the other one has strengths in, other, in another area. That's what IQ is, is, uh, is rated at. So we're, we're dealing with very, very intelligent men. But you, that's obvious. They wouldn't be where they were now if they weren't. And they can, they can, they can manipulate people. They can control people. They can control them. They certainly can. That's what's going on. What about you? What about the Christian? What should you be doing tonight? Praying? What should you be looking for? The election or the uptaker? <laughs> yeah, the uptaker, the shout. That's what we, if we happen to be here next Tuesday, okay. But we may be gone. I mean, we may be gone. Amen, amen. Thank God for the book. Isn't that good? <laughs> yeah, it's the truth. It is the absolute truth that judges every other truth. That book is the truth. And I believe it. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd use what I've said tonight, Lord. I pray that you give us wisdom in this house. And I pray it in Jesus' name. And amen.